Um, thank you for coming out in this rain. Um, I, it was brought to my attention that some of the flyers said 7.30, so that's the only reason we were waiting just a little while. Um, some people may show up. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, I know it's a very tough, uh, difficult uh, topic to talk about, but it is important, very urgent. A lot of people understand it, a lot of people don't. A lot of people think they understand it. Um, a lot of people don't think they understand it, but um, that gives us more the reason to talk about it. So I'm just going to um, say a few words before um, in a little slideshow, and then I'll be introducing our um, speaker, Nandi Darwish, in a little bit. So um, on this campus, I have it prepared. Uh, on this campus, long-term friendships and uh, have been ended. New friendships are questionable. And uh, the campus in Philadelphia Socialist and Islamic organizations are appalled and offended because this organization, Temple University Purpose, dares to bring Islam and Sharia law to, to the arena of discussion, thought, and question. In Afghanistan, Iran, and other Middle Eastern countries, gays, women, Christians and Jews, among other minorities, are being murdered and tortured to death in the name of Islam, according to the ways of Muhammad and Sharia law. It is perplexing that our decision uh, to bring to attention and expose these atrocities that otherwise are hidden from view behind the wall of political correctness and the counterproductive notion of multi multiculturalism is met with such anger and opposition. Uh, people are dying. People are being discriminated, legitimately discrim discriminated. They are being oppressed. Their freedom of speech is punished. Their freedom of religion is denied. And their sense of personal, personal identity is lost. Um, it is lost in a cesspool of an evil emptiness. Uh, someone can say that this evil emptiness is Sharia law. Um, and that Sharia law is the danger. It is the perpetrator, not the savior, not the solution. So why is Temple University purpose Islamophobic? Why am I a racist? Why am I the bigot? I'm not, and we're not. Uh, questioning Islam under equal scrutiny as any other religion is neither Islamophobic nor bigoted. However, it is dangerous taboo and an instant means by which to assassinate someone's character or a group's credibility. This organization, for example, Temple University Purpose, we have, met, we have the most clearly inclusive mission that defends diversity with the sole goal of enhancing one's understanding of others through acquiring knowledge for more, from more than one angle and from more than one source. And that is the and that, is the major and that is what the majority of campus does not like. The fact alone that Temple University Purpose extends um, its forum to points of view outside of the politi correct, politically correct cesspool on which the accepted politically correct topics float uh, makes Temple University Purpose the perfect, most sought after target for character assassination and credibility assassination. Standing up for the rights of those with no voice is no crime of racism or bigotry. Doing so, however, is a responsibility, a responsibility that we proudly take on. Those who oppose those questioning, the questioning of and the proposing, and proposing the shutting down of events regarding anything Islam themselves are embracing the totalitarian mentality adhered to under Sharia. So they are already controlled slaves, and they have no idea. More than often, every semester, the feminists on campus or the socialists both from the, uh, the campus chapters and the city of Philadelphia, along with a number of members of the Islamic organizations on this campus, criticize us for not including or inviting the MSA to participate in joint event. And yes, that is a valid criticism. However, it is an incorrect, misinformed one. Since the spring of 2010, I have personally reached out to the MSA. I have done little things from big sales uh, and they, we have been rejected. Uh, they have shown no interest. And uh, this, and this fall, uh, this fall, I reached out to their current president to work with Purpose on a joint event where both organizations brought a speaker of their choice. But they did not approve of our speaker because he criticized Islam. I thought to myself, what kind of speaker do they want? <coughs> What will, ever be, what will ever be an acceptable speaker? Is that acceptable speaker someone that, that agrees with someone, uh, with the MSA, with, 
with the MSA on everything that they think, everything that they feel. So well, the president of the MSA once told me that um, regarding um, our choice of speaker, the style of the speaker that we, um, that we invite, that that wasn't the etiquette uh, of dialogue. And, you know, I think it's appropriate to say back to the MSA president that it's not the etiquette of dialogue to not join in dialogue simply because you disagree with the point of view um, and the style of speak of the, of the opposing view uh, that the speaker holds. The socialists' arguments is always that it is not the MSA's responsibility to help us provide the speaker um, that we would otherwise have asked the MSA to invite. Sure, that is a valid argument as well. If we allotted more, if we were allotted more money per semester, it would be easier. But we are just one organization, and we are given two thousand five hundred dollars to create one or two events with speakers. Now, taking into account that we have five or six <coughs> Islamic organizations on campus, alone, all of them, uh, which are pretty, are made up of pretty much the same students. Um, however, under differently named Islamic organizations, they are able to get, the, at the very least, $12,500 up to $15,000, as opposed to the $2,500 that we get. And what is worse and most hypocritical of those that criticize us is when one asks, where are the human rights groups on this campus? When it comes to the human rights and the human crimes under Sharia law, where are the feminists? Where are the gay rights groups? And most important, where are those five to six Islamic organizations on this campus now? Why aren't they talking about the oppressive human rights conditions and crimes under Sharia? Well, they are. Earlier today at 4 o'clock, the MSA had an event on Sharia as well. And I can assure you that this event, well, <laughs> this event was to counter us and talk about the beauty and wonder of Islam. And sure, um, there are beautiful things that they consider um, in Islam. However, none of the ugly realistic things um, that happen under Sharia are discussed. And we tried to plan again this past, um, at the end of the semester, we tried again to, to have an event with them, and we went through two speakers that they rejected. They wanted nothing. And so we were fortunate to have uh, Noni Darwish uh, join us. Um, I want to thank Noni Darwish. Uh, she was a Cairo, Cairo born uh, human rights activist. She's she grew up as a Muslim. She knows everything about Sharia, all the conditions. And sometimes it's, well, always it's important to have uh, someone who lived under that to speak about it. And not just read it in the books, not read it from um, biased professors at universities. And from now on, let me just introduce, I'm, I'm done talking, uh, but let me introduce uh, Ms. Nani Darwish, our speaker. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Temple University and Temple University Purpose for inviting me, and also for Young American Foundation for sponsoring me to speak in many universities. I want to start by uh, talking about what's happening in Egypt right now. Um, We've all seen the scenes at Tahrir Square, and we've seen the, this revolution that's budding everywhere in the Middle East. Can you hear me well? Uh, and we all had mixed feelings. I had mi a lot of mixed feelings of hope. Of I was in prayers for my people, my culture of origin. I felt extremely hopeful and I wept, I cried, I, I just wanted to wish uh, the Egyptian people and the Arab people in general the best. I felt their suffering, I felt their pain because I come from the same culture and I know exactly what, they're, what they want. But I wasn't very optimistic because I have not seen signs that say separation of mosque and state. I didn't hear women walking and marching, demanding their freedom under the law, equality under the law. The writers wanted freedom, democracy, but not many really understand what freedom and democracy meant 
75% of Egyptians, when asked in a survey, a very recent survey, do you want to live under Sharia? And the 75% wanted to live under Sharia. How can they live under Sharia and at the same time want freedom and democracy and equality? It's, it, they don't mix, they don't go together. So there is a gap. There is a gap in the thinking of the Middle East people about what is democracy and their love of their religion. And there, is, there has to be some reconciliation. And they have not yet reached that extent. Uh, there was a march by about two, 300 young women, university girls, in Tahrir Square this March, nine, March 9th, they wanted to have a million women march, but only 200 ap appeared in Tahrir Square. And here are the articles about it. This was not published anywhere or talked about in, our, in uh, American media. What happened to these 20, 200 girls 20 of their leaders were arrested in Egypt. They, they accused them of being prostitutes, and they had to undergo go a virginity test to prove they are not prostitutes. That's what happened to the few girls who wanted to march demanding equality under the law for women. Can we have a, uh, equality in this kind of circumstances? Af this is after the revolution. 20 girls were arrested for daring to criticize the system that's not giving them equality. And when I heard that, when I, when I see these articles, when I see, when I see these girls fighting for their basic rights, I can't, I can't stop by really thanking God for me being here in America, being part of this country. I cherish the freedoms that America has given me. And I remember my first day in America on the job. When I started my first job in America, as a new immigrant, I was reading every, everything. I wanted to learn more about this country. And then on the corridor of the, of the job I, was, I started, there was a sign. So I went to read it. And the sign said, this institution does not discriminate against for hiring based on gender, race, national origin, or religion. And to American people, if they read this kind of sign, they take it for granted. Of course. Of course there's no discrimination. But for somebody who came from Sharia law, it was nothing short of a miracle. I was in awe. To read a sign like that, equating me with a man in my rights, no discrimination based on gender, on religious, uh, on your religious background, because where I came from, you are discriminated against based on your gender, legally, under the law, on your, what religion you follow. And I was just thankful. I thank God every day for being in this country. I just want to give you a short, a uh, little bit about my background. I was born and raised as a Muslim in Cairo, Egypt, and I grew up as a child in the 50s in the Gaza Strip. My father headed the Egyptian military intelligence in Gaza, and he was assigned by Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt at that time, to destroy Israel. And Egypt at that time uh, ruled Gaza. My father started the Fidaiyin operations 
against Israel. The word fidei means men who want to self-sacrifice. That's a fidei. So these fideis used to cross the border and cause a lot of da damage, death, destruction inside Israel. And they were considered heroes. Uh, they caused a lot of uh, problems for Israel. And Israel wanted to re retaliate. They tried to stop the, uh, this, uh, I don't know, what's this noise? <laughs> but I hope you can hear me. I attended Gaza elementary schools, and I learned hatred, vengeance, retaliation. Peace was never mentioned as an objective. It was not mentioned at all. It was not a value that we talked about. The only value that we talked about was jihad, martyrdom, killing Jews, throw, throwing them in the sea. That's all we talked about. The victimhood status was very important. We are victims. Because if we're not victims, then why fight the jihad wars? Why, why do anything against our enemies? So being victims, we were spoon-fed the idea of victimhood. They filled our hearts with fear of Jews. For example, I never saw Jews as a child, but we were told Jews would love to kill you. As a, they love to kill Arab children. When you're a child and you hear something like that, hatred becomes easy. Terrorism becomes acceptable. Who wouldn't want to terrorize a monster? They were monsters who wanted to kill us. Then, good, let's terrorize them. Let's send terrorists to blow them up. It was not only good, it was honorable. So that's how that's why we celebrate when somebody goes in a, in a Jewish school and blow it up. That's good. Or go into a Jewish home and blow them up. They, they want to kill us. That's how we felt. And my father was killed eventually in this jihadist operations against Israel. I was eight years old. I lived all my childhood inside the Arab-Israeli conflict. That's what I lived every minute of my day. The bombings in Gaza, the, the schools, that's all we talked about. The politicians, that's all they talked about. The Friday prayers in the mosque, that's all they talked about. The media, the cartoons, everything. We were totally indoctrinated with this kind of hate and propaganda. After my father died, I went, we went, moved back to Cairo. And uh, he was a shaheed. People came. There is no microphone, and then there is this noise, so I don't know. Yeah, move closer and I'll yell. Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, came to our home to pay condolences because my father was a very high-ranking official. And I remember my mom made us stand in line, my siblings and I, to greet him. And if I remember him and other dignitaries. They told us, which one of you kids will avenge your father's blood by killing Jews? I felt 
very uncomfortable, even though I was only eight. It made me feel so uncomfortable that I am expected to do exactly what my father did, kill Jews. I just didn't want to do anything like that. And I looked at my siblings, and none of us answered. We were speechless. But it left me with a feeling that if I really loved my father, that I must kill Jews. It left me with a feeling that I'll be, if I don't want to hate Jews and want to kill them, then something's wrong with me. I'm, I'm not loyal enough to my father. It's, it, and this, this stayed with me until today. And that's why I still remember that question. And now many Arabs today blame today's worldwide Islamic terrorism on the occupation of the West Bank of Gaza. But what about the, the terrorism that happened against Israel and that was before the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza? There was terrorism before all of that. It's not because of the occupation of the West, West Bank and Gaza. I lived for 30 years of my life under Islamic law in, op uh, in oppressive dictatorships and police states. I witnessed honor killing of girls, female genital mutilation. 97% of my mother's generation had undergone this operation, including my own mother. I, I witnessed oppression of women. I never linked it to Islam. I never linked all of that to Sharia law. I thought this is, this is God's will. I grew up hearing cursing, cursing of Jews, non-Muslims, from our religious leaders in mosques. Our religious leaders, every Friday, at the end of every Friday prayers, they ended the prayer with something like that. May God destroy the Jews and the infidels, the enemies of Allah. We are not to befriend them. We are not to, 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 to make any treaties with them. May Allah orphan their children. May Allah uh, kill, uh, you know, orphan their wa uh, wives. And believe it or not, <coughs> if you grow up with this kind of prayers, cursing prayers from so-called religious leaders, it can feel and sound normal and holy. I never doubted that this is not proper from a religious leader. They know better. Who am I to judge my religious leader if they curse? But cursing is so common inside mosques. It happens on a daily basis, cursing the non-Muslims. After 9-11, I learned that Muhammad Atta, the leader of the 19 terrorists, was from Cairo, the same city I came from. He was from a middle class or even uh, upper middle class family educated. And I really felt bad that here is my culture of origin attacking my country here in America right now. And I called many people in Egypt. I wanted them to comfort me. I wanted them to tell me Something is wrong with our upbringing. Why, are we ha do, why do we have thousands and thousands of young men in the Muslim world ready to give up their life just to kill non-Muslims? We have brought up generations. I am one of these people who was brought up to value and to respect and to honor people who want to kill non-Muslims, especially Jews. I thought enough is enough. Having all these airplanes come and blow, young men who are educated have been so indoctrinated to, you know, 
uh, fly airplanes into buildings. This has reached the level of insanity. I called at least eight people in, in Egypt, many of them friends and many of them family. Each and every one of them told me the same thing. How dare you say Arabs did this? Don't you know the Jews did it? It's the Jews, it's a Jewish conspiracy, the Zionists. I hung up the phone and I wept. It is a very lonely feeling to feel that you, you no longer relate to your culture of origin. I loved my culture, but I couldn't relate to this denial of reality. I felt totally disconnected from relating to, to my, my people. How can, how can we accuse even our worst enemy of something that we know very well? We have done ourselves. I mean, every religion, any, any faith should discourage lying and accusing your enemy of having done something that you know you've done yourself. It's Arabs who did this, it's Muslims who did this. Why accuse the Jews of doing it? And it's so frustrating because I don't see Jews or even our media stand up and say, this is a lie. Make a big deal out of it. They're silent. Where is CNN and Fox after this, you know, propaganda? Why don't they bring these sheikhs and these, you know, politicians in the Middle East and tell them, you're saying that the Jews did it. Can you, have, can you prove it? I don't see that. It's only if the Pope says something, he's all over the news. It's only if an Israeli politician says something, he's, 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 he's committed these uh, horrible things. But when these, my, my Muslim re leaders are indulged in awful lies about the Jewish people in America, it suddenly our media just ignores it. I mean, until recently, you know, in the Haiti earthquake, everybody's saying in the in Arab media, oh, the Israel went there only to harvest some, some organs. This was an Arab TV. I have the clips. It's on the internet. The Israelis went to Haiti, not really to, not really to rescue the, the Haitian people in the earthquake. They went to Haiti, and this is by reputable people on Arab TV, only to harvest organs, to steal their organs. And now, what's the latest propaganda in Arab schools today? The latest propaganda is, you know who killed Yasser Arafat? He didn't die natural death. He was killed by the Jews. That is being taught in Arab schools today. Guess what? In 10 or 20 years, it's going to be written in history books in the whole Arab world that Yasser Arafat was killed by the Jews. And you have a new generation of Arabs who want to avenge the death of Yasser Arafat who, by killing the Jews who killed him. We are witnessing today the lies of tomorrow. And we are silent and nobody's talking about it in our media. Only me and a few others who are trying to uncover this propaganda that is being taught to our children in Arab schools today and is going to be in the history book of 54 Muslim countries tomorrow. It's going to be in the history books, just like Muhammad was killed by the Jews. Just like everything done by the Jews. Why? Why all of this propaganda? It's not human. It's not humanly possible to live your whole, a whole culture living on propaganda. That's what I discover my culture was. And it's not, it's not a coincidence. They really don't believe that the Jewish people deserve the truth justice or mercy. The Jewish people are not human. They are the product of apes, pigs, and enemies of Allah. 
They don't, and this is, uh, the Jewish people, it is such a tragedy that this is not exposed properly in the 21st century by the media. It's not properly responded to. And you have 1. billion people being indoctrinated on a daily basis on lies like that. But what I, uh, it's, it's not just a tragedy, it's a <coughs> disgrace. It is a disgrace that today there are cultures that are doing such propaganda and the land of the free and the home of the brave, the land of America is making people like me who's exposing this horrific propaganda a taboo to talk about. It's scary. I'm not saying anything that's a lie. When I say propaganda in the Middle East is horrendous, it's true. You don't have to believe me. Just go on the internet and see what they're saying. Uh, and that's why I started speaking. And I, I know why we're not going to have democracy in the Middle East. 45, at least 45 Muslim countries have signed a Cairo Declaration in 1991 stating that Sharia Islamic law supersedes any other law when it comes to human rights, when it comes to the laws of the, of the land. There is uh, the, the Constitution of, of Egypt today states that Sharia law supersedes any other law. How many signed it? How many countries? 45 Muslim countries, countries signed the 1991 Cairo Declaration. And guess what? After the revolution, nobody can take out this, I, uh, this uh, statement from from the from the from Egypt's constitution. It's, uh, it's it's number two in the in the constitution of Egypt. El Baradai, El Baradai. He's he he is trying to run for president in Egypt. He hinted hinted at removing this. Uh, uh, I think it's. Uh, Item two of the Egyptian, Article, Article two of the Egyptian uh, Constitution. He hinted at removing it. When he was walking in the street, after he hinted at it, rocks were thrown at him. No Muslim leader will survive if he removes Sharia as the basis of the law of any Muslim country. I'll tell you why. Why is that so? Why can't a Muslim leader survive? Because in Sharia, the job of a Muslim head of state is already stated. Number one of the job of any Muslim head of state is to preserve Sharia as the law of the land and never accept novelty. They call it in Arabic beda. Never accept any novel ideas. This is already, his job as a Muslim head of state is already established under, under Islamic law. Number two, in what a Muslim head of state must do, it's a Muslim head of state must, must conduct jihadist operations against non-Muslim countries, <coughs> Jews, Christians, and pagans. Job number two of every Muslim head of state. Is it of the no, that's the Sharia books. That's Sharia books. Sharia bo the, Cairo, the Cairo Declaration states only that we must follow Sharia. It supersedes any other law. But the Sharia books state that a Muslim head of state must do jihad. And then it defines what jihad is. So a lot of people after 9-11 uh, on American TV, they were defining jihad 
as an inner struggle self-analysis, something like that's really like Buddhist. It, it didn't sound uh, Islamic at all. And I'm not going to tell you my opinion of what jihad is, but according, uh, and by the way, I like the inner struggle interpretation of jihad, but I've never heard it in the Middle East. <laughs> I lived for 30 years of my life in the Middle East. I never heard that jihad is just an inner struggle and self-analysis, because we're not very good at doing that. <laughs> Here is the definition of jihad from the Sharia books. To war against non-Muslims, to establish their religion. There are many other, uh, many other statements like that in Sharia book. For example, fleeing from the jihad wars or fleeing from combat with unbelievers is an enormity that will, uh, that's punishable by death. And all of, the, all of the statements I'm saying now, I have the references, page number and everything in the Sharia books. Since the jihad is the main duty of a Muslim head of state, uh, also, the, you know, I'll give you another quotation because there are so many quotations in the Sharia that tells the Muslim head of state to never make peace with non-Muslim countries and treat them always as inferior. Here, the Khalifa fights all other people until they become Muslim. When non-Muslims are in their own country, in which case jihad is a communal obligation upon Muslims each year, he who, who provides the equipment for a soldier in jihad has himself performed jihad. So all the people who are donating the money for Al-Qaeda and Hamas and Hezbollah from Arabian Peninsula, all this oil money that's going there, they will never survive without that money, by the way. They are doing jihad themselves, according to the Sharia. What the West needs to understand is that jihad, the jihad doctrine, challenges the sovereignty of non-Muslim countries. There is, Islam does not recognize America as a sovereign state. It doesn't recognize any non-Muslim country, Europe, as a sovereign state. It's open to jihad. It's Dar al-Harb. We must fight it because it's not a legitimate state, because it's not a Muslim state. That is jihad. And until we understand what jihad means, really, we're in trouble. The uh, there is another law here. The Khalifa makes war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians until they become Muslim or else pay the non-Muslim poll tax while being belittled. while being belittled, while you are, you, you are demeaning them. They have to feel demeaned. And by the way, this is from, from their books. I'm not, if anybody, uh, I, you know, if there's anybody who wants to challenge me, I'll give you the law number 09.6, page 602 in Reliance of the Traveler. The Khalifa fights all other people until they become Muslims. I mean, it's repeated over and over. Uh, I'll take questions at the end as long as you want. The, it's this duty of jihad is, is all over Muslim scriptures. It's not just what once or twice or three times. It's the main topic of Islam. Even when the Khalifa appoints a ruler on a region that's in an area that borders or adjacent to enemy land, by enemy land they mean non-Muslim land. He has the right by himself to undertake jihad against these enemies, dividing the spoils of battle among combatants and reserving recipients. So the property of non-Muslim lands doesn't belong to them. 
their property after you subdue them and you go into war with them, their property is yours. It's legitimate. Uh, so this is what we're dealing with. And you wonder why Sadat was killed? When Sadat signed the peace treaty with Israel and meant it, he was violating his duty as a Muslim head of state. When he signed it, he told his confidants, I know I'm signing my death warrant. Why? Because he is violating Sharia law as a Muslim head of state. And that's why I said that was killed. And not a lot of people understand that. Uh, Muslim, ha Muslim head of states, this is very important to understand why Muslim heads of states, they all, when they talk to their people, they say one thing. When they talk to the West, they say something else. Because they're in a quagmire. If they please the international community, they have violated Sharia law. And if they talk to their people about jihad, which what their people want to hear, they are violating international law. So it's a quagmire. It's not that they are evil as much as they are, they can be killed. Their life is on the line. Um, and that's exactly what happened to Sadat. There is also a Sharia law that, that is uh, really uh, against our Constitution. And it says it's obligatory to obey the Khalifa even if he's unjust. So a Muslim head of state, as long as he rules under Sharia, as long as he rules by the Sharia, he must be obeyed even if he is unjust. And you wonder why there are the Saddam Husseins of the Middle East and the Qazafis of the Middle East. They are ruled by Sharia, and you cannot tell them why they are unjust. You have to obey. Rebellion against the Khalifa, even if he's unjust, is an enormity. I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading from Sharia books. It's considered a, an enormity uh, with the death penalty. Under Sharia law, and this is something that's totally against our Constitution, and I don't know, I really don't understand people like uh, relig religious leaders here, Muslim in America, who are saying, oh, but Sharia is so compatible with our Constitution. It's so, there's no, we, we, we're just like uh, apple pie and, um, you know, American. Why do you say this about Sharia, they tell me. Okay. Here, I'll, I'll give you a law. The Khalifa is allowed to hold office through seizure of power, meaning through force. Law number 025.4. Muslim American is an oxymoron. Yeah. Here it is. A law that says that, uh, uh, you know, let's not. I was married to a very hard working Muslim. No, it's, Let's, let's, uh, let's get into a discussion of questions later. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk later about all the... Uh, by the way, I'm, I, I love Muslim people. My, my, the people, it's not the people, it's the idea. It's this, it's the law. What I, what I object to is the law. If a Muslim head of state, let's say in an Arab country, if you look at the history of every Muslim head of state, you'll find that they came to power through a coup d'etat, assassinating of a previous president. Why is that? And, it's, and he becomes accepted as a leader later. People clap and, and cheer for him after that. Why? We think it's, it's done just because the people are, are ignorant or not educated enough to understand that this is not, uh, this is not a proper way to come to power through seizure of power like that, to a coup d'etat, it's allowed under the law. The people are not stupid. They're following their laws. And that is why there is no political stability. Elections are never mentioned 
in, in, the, in Sharia. Actually, there is a lot of Muslim leaders who say democracy as it's practiced in the West is anti-Islamic. And I'm not the one who says so. So, a Muslim head of state also is exempt from being charged with serious crimes such as murder, adultery, robbery, theft, and drinking. So all these Muslim heads of states who, are, who have to drink wine and, and they kill their people, they murder, they rob their, their, their people, they put the money in the Swiss bank accounts. Look what Yasser Arafat did with the money that he had for his people. Look at what Yasser Arafat did. It's allowed. He, they will never be charged under the laws of Sharia. They are not to be charged. So we, we really cannot blame it on these dictators that they are living like that. They have to rule by Sharia. They, have, they cannot be charged with, with the same crimes they are prosecuting the people with. And at the same time, it's an enormity to, uh, to uh, write or rebel against them. All cannot survive in a democracy. It's, it's, not, it's, it's totally against our system of democracy. Because Sharia really is a dictator-friendly law. And it, uh, it's amazing. Many Arabs blame the existence of their dictatorships on America. Oh, it's America's fallen policy. That's, you're preserving our dictators. Well, when, when did they ever have a democracy? Never. Democracy and freedom was never the state of affair in, in, the, in Islamic history. Actually, America deals with whoever the leader is. Whether it's, uh, they deal with certain leaders because they want a stable government. That's all they want. America, all they want is a stable government to deal with. And what about the dictators like the Syrian dictator, uh, uh, Libyan dictator? America is not their friends, but they're still dictators. So you can't say that America's foreign policy is the, is the cause of dictatorships. That's the system that they have there. We befriend some, we don't befriend some. And that is, uh, blaming and finger pointing is, is the only solution. And we should never accept the claim that, uh, that American foreign policy perpetuates dictatorships. It's the state of affairs in the political systems of Arab countries. That claim also uh, that, uh, was, was promoted by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. But even though this is absurd, many Westerners uh, about this claim that America's foreign policy is, is behind dictatorships. They don't understand that the reason for all of this anger, which has been building in the culture of jihad since the, since the seventh century, Muslims must justify jihad, which is against international law. Jihad is the violation of the supremacy and, and sovereignty of non-Muslim countries. And to justify jihad, you have to blame the cultures that you want to uh, conquer. So we have to blame them for our dictators. We have to blame them for occupation. We have to blame them for, I'm a victim. And that's the best way to fight them under the guise of being the victim. When in reality, the West is now the victim. Europe is now the victim. How many Christians can practice their religion in the Middle East without being killed? They, they are rioting because somebody burned the Quran. The, Quran. the Bibles are being burned on a daily basis in the Muslim world. Churches are being burned on a daily basis in Egypt. 
every Christmas there is a church where they have drive-by shooting on the people when they are leaving, leaving the, the churches every in, in Cairo. The homes of the Christians in Egypt are being burnt. This is almost a weekly event. Where are the riots by the Christians in the West? It's not even mentioned in the media here. Uh, Islam is the only religion on earth that legally kills those who leave it. It's against the law, the laws of Sharia, in all the schools of Sharia. No exception. There are four schools of Sunni Sharia, and there are two schools of Shiite Sharia, uh, Sharia. All of them agree that a Muslim who leaves his or her religion must be killed. I am now on a death sentence under Sharia. And I still told you're not supposed to speak about it. Don't talk. You have to repress your, your, your rights because you're going to offend somebody. I have no wish to offend anybody. It's not something I'm proud of to speak about my culture of origin. But the truth has to come out. Nobody wants to criticize a religion, any religion, let alone my religion of origin. Some of the nicest people I meet are Muslims. I'm not speaking about the Muslim people. I'm speaking about a legal system, a, a horrific, barbaric legal system called Sharia that's oppressing people. Nobody in the West, myself, wants to criticize religion. I don't want to criticize, uh, you know, uh, Hinduism. I don't want to criticize Judaism, Christianity, or even Islam. But if a religion expands itself so much to become a state. If a religion expands itself by itself so much to demand a legal system, call it Sharia. And under that legal system, they want to put me to death because I don't want to follow a religion. Then that, that religion has expanded itself so much that it's no longer protected not to be criticized from criticism. That religion has expanded itself so much that it has a military institution called jihad that violates the sovereignty of every non-Muslim country. You are not sovereign for Muslim country to protect yourself. You should not protect yourself from Islam. And that's the, that's the purpose of jihad, the jihadist obligation. That's why you Dar al-Harb, land of war. If a religion has expanded itself so much to become a state and a legal system and a military institution, then that religion has opened itself to criticism. Amen. And that religion, it's my duty and the duty of every free non-Muslim country to criticize that religion because it's no longer a religion. It's a state. It's a constitutional state that violates the rights of people who don't follow it. And even people who follow it. And that's why I'm speaking. I'm not speaking because I just want haphazardly to criticize Islam. Who cares? I have better things to do. But I cannot let myself be under a death sentence and stay silent. Even there are many people in Egypt today who are in hiding 
because they don't want to practice Islam. I am in touch with many of them. And they are living a horrendous life. Some Christians who convert to Islam and regret it in Egypt. I want to go back to Christianity. Do you know that the law in Egypt today, today, prevents them from doing that? It's against the law to leave Islam. Even if you were a Christian, you fell in love with a Muslim girl, you changed your religion to Islam to marry her, then the marriage didn't work out. Now I want to go back to, 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 to Christianity and marry my, my, you know, a Christian woman. I can't, you can't. It's against the law in Egypt today. This is the, these are facts. What I'm talking about are facts. It's against the law. There is a, a man, his name is Muhammad uh, Hagazi. He's a Muslim man who wanted to convert to Christianity for the first time in Egyptian history. He challenged the laws. His story became international, so nobody wants to kill him, but he, got, he gets beaten a lot on the street. He wants to convert to, Islam, to Christianity legally because it's, your religion is by, by, you know, by force in Egypt. You're, you're born and your birth certificate is dead. Muslim, Christian, Muslim. He wanted to have the right in Egypt to call, uh, name, he, his wife was pregnant. He wanted the, the, his son to, on his birth certificate to have it stamped Christian and to call his son a Christian name. He could not under Egyptian laws today. It's illegal under Sharia. It's illegal in almost all Muslim countries, <coughs> including Turkey. A lot of people think Turkey, oh, Turkey is so, Free, you know, you can't, you can't legally leave your religion in Turkey. It's against the laws of the country, let alone Sharia. Guess what? Hamad Hagazi's son is a Muslim legally by force against his father's wishes, and he's in hiding. That's what I'm talking about. The rights of these people. And. Uh, under, under Sharia law, there are three murders where a Muslim is forgiven for. Say, anybody, any Muslim on the street in the Middle East. Three murders. And it says here, I'm, I'm reading it from the Sharia books. Under Sharia, a Muslim is forgiven for killing an apostate, killing an adulterer who's usually an adulteress, and killing a highway robber. What does that mean? When you forgive a Muslim for killing an apostate? It means vigilante street justice is allowed on the street. And you wonder why they walk in the streets, burn and kill and get angry. You wonder why? Because it's allowed under the law. It's allowed under the law. So I, if I walk in Egypt, I cannot visit the Middle East, by the way because I'd be killed. If I walk in the streets of Egypt now, I'm not just afraid of the government. Anybody can kill me, and he'll be defended. He'll be defended by these laws. Some people will say, you're lying. You're exaggerating. In 1991, there was a journalist, um, an Egyptian journalist, who was uh, speaking against certain uh, uh, rights for uh, oppression of women, uh, and uh, he was accused of being an apostate. He, was not, he said, I'm not an apostate. I'm just speaking against Sharia. He was criticizing Sharia heavily. And just by merely criticizing Sharia, he was accused of apostasy. He was gunned down in front of his home, in front of his son. When he, in the trial of his murder, his murderer, was defended by none other than the Sheikh of Al Azhar, the top Muslim authority in Cairo. The Grand Sheikh of Al Azhar went to his trial and said, 
since our government does not, does not kill those who are called apostates, then anyone on the street can kill them. It's okay. The man who killed him never, uh, at the end, write it down. Can confirm that. Yeah. Right, the same is true. Yeah. The man who killed that journalist was never uh, put in jail because of the laws of Sharia that we want to bring here in America.